Hi guys, my name is Jack and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. According to official figures, more than tens of millions of people go missing every year around the world. About a third of them are found alive and unharmed. Almost half of them are found after a while dead as a result of accidents or murdered. And about two million people disappear without a trace every year. The latter are usually found neither alive nor dead, even after many years. The story of Agnes Clavina made a lot of noise in the fall of 2014, when a young and very attractive woman who was having fun in a club with friends as if vanished into thin air. Everyone who might have been involved seemed to escape any responsibility. However, in 2023, nine years after the tragedy, the case took a completely unexpected turn. But let's get to the bottom of it. Who is Agnes Clavina? Our today's heroine was born in 1984, July 8th, in the capital of Latvia, the city of Riga. She grew up in an ordinary family and became the youngest of two daughters of her parents. Agnes's own sister, Greta, was only a couple of years older than her, so the girls were always very friendly and almost inseparable. The parents did their best to give their daughters a good education and let them realize their dreams. Agnes grew up a sociable, cheerful, and very active girl, she did well at school, played sports, and had a lot of friends. In the future, she dreamed to connect her profession with tourism or entertainment, because she loved to travel and knew how to organize perfect leisure time. In addition, Agnes also had a bright appearance and a spectacular figure, so men always gave her their attention and compliments. The girl from a young age has always had a lot of admirers who in every way to get her attention. After graduating from school, Agnes worked for some time in the service industry while attending language courses and studying to be a tourism manager. At the age of 20, she decided to move from her native Latvia to the foggy Albion and settled in London. She believed that here, she would have more prospects and opportunities to unlock all her potential and talents. Parents and older sister did not oppose her decision and sincerely supported. Soon after the move, the beautiful blonde met a young man whose name was Michael Mills. He was older than Agnes by eight years, had a good education, owned his own thriving business, opened a small movie theater and entertainment complex, and was considered a very successful man. He and Agnes quickly found a common language and soon began dating. Michael wooed Agnes beautifully, gave expensive gifts. Together they traveled and made far-reaching plans for their future together. The couple was truly in love and happy. It seemed that a long and prosperous life awaited them. According to the memories of those close to Agnes, this was her first true love. She seemed to glow at the sight of her chosen one and dreamed of becoming his lawful wife soon. In 2014, Clavina was offered a three-month labor contract as an administrator in one of the largest and most popular nightclubs in the Spanish resort town of Marbella. Naturally, this job implied a temporary move to another country, but the ambitious and purposeful young woman did not want to miss this opportunity at all. Michael could not give up everything and go to Spain with his beloved because of his job, but he was not against her signing the contract. For Agnes, it was a great opportunity to try herself in a new field of activity to gain invaluable experience and perhaps further move and develop in this direction. It should be noted that Marbella is one of the most famous and attractive resorts on the Mediterranean coast. Here come vacationers from different parts of the world, mostly wealthy people who go to have fun and spend money. Here you can often meet show business stars, as well as famous athletes and businessmen. Clavina, who has always been very sociable, liked working in such a place. Before moving, she visited her family in Latvia, and told them that she had signed a favorable employment contract for three months. She also shared another piece of good news. After returning to England, she and Michael were planning to get married. Dad, mom, and sister were genuinely happy for Agnes and wished her luck. At the end of May 2014, Agnes, having packed only the most necessary things for one season, went to work in sunny Spain. Her lover stayed in London, but they called each other daily and communicated via video link, telling each other about everything that was happening to them. Clavina actively maintained her pages in various popular social networks, where she posted daily photos, small videos, and stories. 
She got a lot of followers who closely followed her activities and work. It was obvious that Agnes lived an interesting, busy life and enjoyed every day. After the end of her employment contract, Agnes decided to stay in Spain for a couple more months. It was the beginning of the velvet season in the resort, and during this period it was possible to earn good money. She consulted her boyfriend and he supported her and promised to visit her for a few days because they had not seen each other for a long time and missed each other very much. Agnes almost immediately got a job as a hostess in a high-end restaurant and renewed her lease. In September, as expected, Michael visited her. They were having fun, planning the upcoming wedding, and choosing a place to go on honeymoon. Less than a week later, the young man returned back to London, and Agnes had to work in Spain for another month, after which she was going to visit her relatives in Latvia, and then fly to England to her lover. But these plans, alas, were not destined to come true. On September 6th, Agnes, in the company of her friends, went to one of the popular nightclubs in the region, the Costa del Sol. A few hours before, she had called her fiancé, who was aware of her plans and did not object to Agnes having fun with her friends. The young people enjoyed themselves and took pictures together, and Agnes posted several of them on her online profile that night. According to the memories of those who saw her that fatal night, the bright blonde was wearing a spectacular short dress and carrying a tiny white clutch handbag. Toward morning, when the friends were about to go home, Agnes said she planned to stay a little longer and then take a cab. She was always quite serious and responsible, and Agnes had not had much to drink, so her companions saw no reason to worry. At that moment, when the friends said goodbye and headed for the exit, Clavina was talking to a man who had bought her a cocktail and was clearly trying to win Agnes's favor. After that night, Clavina was never seen again, alive or dead. It seemed as if she had simply vanished into the crowded nightclub. No one could remember what time and with whom the blonde left the establishment or where she had gone afterwards. The next day, Agnes did not show up at work, and when trying to contact her, it turned out that her phone was switched off. Colleagues and friends were the first to raise the alarm, but the police were slow to respond to their missing persons report. Toward evening, a worried Michael called Agnes's mother and said that he had been unable to contact his fiancé all day, which had never happened before. The next day, Agnes's parents and fiancé jointly tried to contact the Spanish police to report the disappearance. However, they were told that the relatives had to file such a report in person, otherwise it would not be considered. After these words, Michael and Clavin's family took the next flight to Marbella. In the end, the missing persons report was filed by the family only five days after Agnes had disappeared without a trace. The first thing that was checked was the apartment Agnes had rented, but it looked as if the owner had gone out for a while and would be back soon. Documents, money, and a few expensive pieces of jewelry were in their places. The refrigerator was stocked with prepared food, and on the bed were several outfits from which Agnes had chosen what to wear to the club on her last night. It was obvious that Clavina had not been in her apartment since the day she had gone out with her friends. Her phone had been turned off, she had left no more posts on social media, and she had not responded to any messages. It was only then that the police began investigating the disappearance, but precious time was irretrievably lost. Agnes's friends and family began to post flyers all over the city with her picture and requests for help in the search. The story was also picked up by the media, featured on television news programs, and Agnes's pictures were on the front pages of local newspapers. The first leads and clues emerged after the police studied the footage from the CCTV cameras located inside and outside the entertainment venue. However, there were also some problems with this, because all the files had already been erased by that time, and the police had to ask for help from specialists in order to restore them. But the efforts were not in vain, and on one of the recordings, made by a camera located at the exit to the parking lot, it was seen how Agnes, around six o'clock in the morning, leaves the club with a man, and does it clearly not of her own free will. This last footage, which showed Clavina alive, was to be studied in detail, but the closer the experts looked at them, the more frightening they seemed. Agnes was being led by a man of large build, and it was obvious that she was walking with him under compulsion because he was holding her tightly by the waist. Agnes looked frightened, tried to break free several times and said something emotionally, 
but her companion persistently led her to the parking lot, where he literally forced her into his Mercedes A63 with tinted windows. At the moment when the big man was pushing her into the cabin, it was visible that another man was already inside. While the first man was heading for the driver's seat, Agnes managed to open the car door, after which she tried to get out and escape. But at that moment, the doorman who was standing next to her came up, and the driver gestured and said something. The doorman pushed Agnes back into the car, after which the driver handed him something, apparently a cash reward for his help. About six minutes after Agnes was in the car, her phone was switched off and was never switched on again. It was also impossible to trace the further movement of the vehicle because there were no CCTV cameras along the way. It became obvious that the men who were in the cabin were the last to contact the missing beauty. Surprisingly, the case was given a high level of secrecy from the start. Everyone involved in the investigation signed non-disclosure documents, and information was not only kept out of the press, but even Agnes's loved ones were hardly ever given any information. For the first few months, parents and fiancé were kept in the dark. They were only told that the investigation was underway and that it was too early to draw any conclusions. But judging by the fact that Agnes had not given any information about herself during this time, there was little hope that she was still alive. Michael periodically gave interviews in which he asked for help in finding his fiancé, but no one ever responded to his requests. Only six months later, the relatives were shown the very footage from the club cameras, as well as the names of all three men who had last contacted Agnes. The large man who had forcibly taken the young woman out of the club and pushed her into the car was identified as Wesley Capper, the son of a well-known British millionaire and a very powerful man. In the passenger compartment of the car sat his longtime buddy named Craig Porter, who had no particular occupation and was periodically on the police's radar. The third was a dark-skinned doorman whose name was Sian Usman. Porter and Usman stated unanimously under interrogation that they were innocent, that Agnes had gotten into the car voluntarily. According to Capper, he and a friend spotted the beautiful blonde in a club and approached her to get acquainted. She was allegedly already pretty drunk, which contradicts the testimony of her friends, but didn't refuse a drink when they bought her a drink. Wesley then proposed to continue the party at his luxurious house in the country, to which Agnes agreed. Already in the car, Agnes allegedly changed her mind about going to the private party at Wesley's house and asked to be dropped off in the middle of the road, saying she would take a cab and go to her home. The man claimed to have dropped the passenger off where she asked, which was an unlit stretch of road that soon turned out to have no CCTV cameras either. But Craig Porter could neither confirm nor deny the words of Wesley Capper because he himself, according to his confession, was also very drunk and did not even understand when and how Agnes was in their car. Moreover, he stated that he fell asleep as soon as they drove away from the parking lot, and when he woke up, the young woman was no longer in the cabin. The third suspect, the doorman Sian Usman, also said that Agnes Clavina was drunk, but could not answer the question whether she had gotten into the car voluntarily. He did, however, confirm that when the car touched down, the blonde opened the door and almost fell out as she was driving. Then the doorman, at the request of the driver, slammed the door, for which he received a substantial tip. When Sienu's main was asked whether he thought it was strange that the woman had tried to escape by jumping out of the car while walking, he said he didn't think it was an escape attempt. In his opinion, she could have accidentally opened the door because she was intoxicated. He also added that Agnes did not scream or ask for help. The footage clearly showed Wesley Capper forcefully leading Agnes to the car, holding her by the waist and wrist. Wesley's defense was that Agnes was dizzy and he was holding her down so that she would not fall. Sometime later, the investigation came across another curious but also strange and frightening video which was made in Soto Grande in the south of Spain, in the port of Puerto de la Duquesa. The luxury yacht of John Capper, a millionaire who was the father of one of the suspects, was moored there. The footage, dated September 10th, four days after Agnes's disappearance, shows Wesley, Craig, and two other men boarding the yacht. They were carrying a large suitcase which, judging from the footage, was quite weighty, as well as a rolled-up carpet. When the company returned to the port of Puerto de la Duquesa a few days later, 
they had no luggage with them. After the footage was shown to Capper, he claimed that he and his friends had sailed to Ibiza to have fun. The suitcase, he said, contained their belongings and what the investigation mistook for a carpet was bedding. Where it all subsequently went, he could not explain. A thorough search of Wesley's yacht and automobile yielded no results. As it turned out, both had been cleaned and dry-cleaned, destroying any traces of DNA. However, a long blonde hair was found in the trunk of the car, but it was not possible to establish its origin, because this crucial evidence mysteriously evaporated during the investigation. At the trial, the prosecution told another curious detail. As it turned out, a few hours after Agnes was in the defendant's car, Capper called the emergency services several times, but each time he dropped the call without waiting for an answer, as if he was afraid or doubted the correctness of his actions. The man himself explained that he was drunk and made the calls randomly. The lawyer for the Claven family stated that Agnes, in his opinion, was long dead and that her body was resting somewhere on the seabed in the very suitcase that the suspects had brought aboard the yacht. In addition, he believed that the case was deliberately delayed and the criminals had plenty of time to get rid of all the evidence that could prove their guilt. Only a year and a half after Agnes's disappearance, Capper, Porter, and Usman found themselves in the dock. They were accused of holding Agnes against her will and forcing her into a car. Unfortunately, due to the lack of evidence, there was nothing more to charge them with. Moreover, the millionaire and his friend were released on bail and quietly left the courtroom. Naturally, Agnes's relatives were outraged by this, but the judge was adamant. All three men were only brought to trial again in 2019, almost five years after Agnes's disappearance. They still denied their guilt and insisted that Clavina had gotten into the car of her own free will. The prosecutor asked that the doorman be considered an accomplice to the crime because he helped the defendants drive the victim away. Usman could have received a sentence of five years in prison for his actions. In response, he made a fiery speech in which he said that he was among the suspects because of the color of his skin, as well as the lack of opportunity to hire a good lawyer because all the money he earns, he sends to a starving family in Africa. Capper and Porter's lawyers insisted that their clients were guilty only of persuading Agnes to get into the car, but not of forcing her to do so. In their opinion, the young woman was dropped off on the road as she had requested, but while she was waiting for a cab to go home, she could have been kidnapped and killed by third parties because Agnes was drunk and could not offer much resistance. The verdict of the judge surprised and angered the relatives of the missing young woman because none of the defendants, in fact, was not punished at all. Usman was cleared of all charges. Capper was sentenced to two years for taking advantage of Agnes's drunken state to persuade her to get into his car, and Porter received six months for complicity. In reality, the men received suspended sentences and did not spend a single day in prison, but paid Agnes's family the ridiculous sum of £10,000 sterling in compensation. Clavin's family were discouraged by the decision and appealed. And then it turned out that both defendants in the case while waiting for the court's decision, managed to break the law once again. Capper, being in a state of alcoholic and drug intoxication, knocked down a woman to death and fled the scene, and Porter and his friend, also drunk, stole a car, having previously beaten its owner to a pulp. But even for this serious crime, Capper was sentenced only to probation, thanks to the brilliantly built defense of his lawyers. He paid a large sum in compensation to the family of the woman killed under the wheels of his car, and he himself remained at large. Porter was less fortunate this time, and he still went to jail, but there is no information in public sources about the sentence he received. In 2021, almost seven years after Agnes's disappearance, the main suspect in the case was punished. Wesley had been living an immoral lifestyle all this time, abusing alcohol and illicit substances, which had severely compromised his health. At the height of the Kavita pandemic, he found himself in a hospital bed, and when he thought he had conquered the disease, he suddenly had a stroke. Capper died on July 26, 2021, in his 44th year of life. At that time, Agnes's parents filed another appeal with the court. But now the suspect can no longer be prosecuted because he is dead, 
no matter what the Supreme Court decides in this difficult case. An unexpected twist nine years later. Although Agnes Clavina was never found dead or alive, she was still presumed dead some time later. Her parents, sister and fiancé, agreed with the lawyer's version that the criminals had placed Agnes's body in a suitcase, which was subsequently loaded onto a yacht and dumped somewhere on the high seas so that it could not be found. However, in the summer of 2023, nine years after Agnes disappeared without a trace, the case took an unexpected turn, so in mid-June, a gardener of one of the elite golf clubs, La Quita, located in the Costa del Sol region cleaning the area, found a strange object near the coast, which upon closer inspection, turned out to be an old, badly damaged suitcase. The man did not dare to open it himself and called the police. Inside the suitcase, law enforcers found human remains. The examination showed that the bones found belonged to a young woman whose approximate age at the time of death was 25, 35 years old. In addition, it was also found that the suitcase with the body inside had spent about 10 years in the water before it was brought to the shore. After comparing all the facts, the police hypothesized that the body found belonged to Agnes Clavina, who disappeared nine years ago. In order to establish this unequivocally, a number of examinations are required to compare Agnes's DNA with the remains found. At the moment, experts are working closely on this issue, but the details of the investigation have not yet been made public. If the suspicions are confirmed, it will be a reason to reopen the case and bring the surviving suspects to trial. Thanks for watching, guys. That was Jack with you. Subscribe to the channel. There are many shocking stories ahead.